Hey, I'm Luke, and today we're going to talk about Lord of Chaos, Book 6 of The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. If you haven't read this book yet, definitely stop watching this video right now and go read it before watching this video. I'm about to thoroughly spoil this book and potentially any of the other books before this in The Wheel of Time, not including the prequel. So that's anything from The Eye of the World through Lord of Chaos is fair game for spoilers inside both this video and in the comments under this video. Um, nothing from the prequel and also nothing from any of the books later in the series is going to be included inside this video. And please, if you leave a comment, also don't do any spoilers beyond this book in the series, um, both for myself, because this is finally the last video where I am now caught up by the time we're done talking here today with where I am in the series. So I haven't read beyond this yet. Don't spoil it for me. And then, of course, don't spoil it for anyone that might be watching these videos along while they're reading. So if you've read through The Lord of Chaos, then you're in the right place. If you read beyond that, then obviously you know what you're doing, so don't worry about it. If you're new to my channel, then definitely go check out some of my other videos for, first before this. I mean, they're not required, but you know, it makes sense if you're going to jump into my series in the Wheel of Time, start with Eye of the World rather than Lord of Chaos. Um, but I guess that's up to you, really. With that, that out of the way, let's get into it. So before we actually get into the meat of the book, into the actual analysis of the characters, themes, what have you, I think we do need to talk a little bit about just like a quick summary, because a lot of stuff happens in this book. Um, in particular, this book, Lord of Chaos, there's just like the whole theme of chaos. We're going to get into that later, but a lot of stuff happens in this book. Honestly, I don't even feel like we're supposed to catch all of it. I think it's supposed to be too chaotic, but I'm going to do my best to actually try to really take this book apart and look through all the chaos to see what order lies underneath that. And that's only going to be possible if we're really on the same page as far as what happened in the book. So I don't want to make this a long, boring video of just recapping what we've already seen. So I'm going to go as fast as I possibly can, really just rail through the points at max speed. I'll put um, an outline up on the side of the screen so you can also follow along with that if you want. But if you just want to skip this completely, I'll also do chapters. So feel free to just skip to the next one. I'm going to hold off on analysis in this summary section, so you're totally fair to skip this if you don't care about a summary. Let's get into it. We start off with Demondred going to the Pit of Doom to commune with Shaitan. Several, perhaps all, of the Forsaken have been doing this, but not all receive a response. Demondred does. He meets a particularly tall and strange Merdral who the Forsaken must respect, named Shaitar Haran, Hand of the Dark. All the Forsaken wish to be made Nablus, the highest command under Shaitan when the darkness wins. Shaitan has some plan that we don't hear, except for the command, quote, let the Lord of Chaos rule. Erengar and Osengar awaken in new bodies. Osengar is a man's body and Erengar has a woman's. Erengar was definitely a man before and is angry about their new body. From context, Osengar seems to have been a man before as they are not concerned with their new body and the excuse provided is that these were simply the best bodies available, which wouldn't make sense if they were a man and a woman with a man and a woman's bodies switched. But it's possible that this is just dry humor from Shadar. We don't know for sure which Forsaken these are, but Shaitan is unable to reincarnate Ravan in this way because he was killed with Balefire. Moraine killed Bilal with Balefire as well, so he's also not an option. From the wording, it is strongly implied that neither is Lanfear. That leaves Agonar, Balthamel, Ishmael, and Asmodian. Given Shaitan's statement that Asmodian was weak, I would guess that neither is Asmodian, but that's not certain. Erengar disguises herself as Helema among the Saladar Aes Sedai. At the very end of the book, she frees Moghedian, telling her that she's been summoned to Shiagul. The weather throughout every country we see, likely the entire world, is altered by Shaitan. Despite being time for winter, it's uncomfortably hot. This is not only a constant reminder of the coming apocalypse and the persistent irritation, but also a real concern for agriculture that will likely cause massive famine. Throughout Lord of Chaos, Rand continually travels, capital T, between Kyrian and Camelon, trying to hold the political situation together until he can make Elaine queen of both. The situation is not stable anywhere, as various nobles strive to claim these thrones for themselves. This is not resolved by the end of the book. Beralain and Ruark are doing a good job of leading in Kyrian. Elaine is not happy to learn that Rand means to give her the thrones. Mergase is still alive, but held prisoner by Pedrin Nael. Over the course of the book, Nell manages to convince her to sign a contract. The Children of the Light will help her retake Camelin, but will leave a garrison behind, as well as a court of law, separate from the laws of Andor. Mergase isn't happy with this arrangement, but sees no alternative, given that she believes that Rand means to keep Camelin for himself. Devrim Bashir, Marshal General of Saldea, commands a garrison in Camelin. He continues to support Rand. Recall that Davrim and Diera are Zarin's parents. Towards the end of the book, they meet Perrin. Despite a confrontational first meeting, the marriage is ultimately accepted by them. 
Egwene continues her training with the Wise Ones until she's summoned to Saladar. Walking through Teleron Ryod to arrive in just hours, she's made Amarlin of the Rebel Aes Sedai. She's clearly meant to be a puppet, but so far she's doing an excellent job of asserting herself. The White Tower is broken. Elida continues to rule in Tarvalam while most of the Aes Sedai were familiar with build power in Saladar. Both sides wish to control Rand. Elida aims to make Rand a puppet with no agency of his own. Those in Saladar are torn, with some wanting more of an alliance and others wanting the same as Elida. Neither side trusts Rand at all, and both aim to control him as much as they are able. Their differences aren't so much ethical as they are practical. We don't yet know what Egwene's approach will be as Amerlin. She may force a more amicable relationship with Rand, but we don't know how news of the Ashaman will strike her. She definitely feels as though Rand has become too arrogant, but whether this is a personal opinion or something that she'll carry into her political relationship with him hasn't come out yet. Gareth Bryn has built a large army for the rebel Aes Sedai. By the end of Lord of Chaos, Egwene has the rebels marching on Tarvalon. Galena and Katarin, Aes Sedai following Elida, are Black Aja. Right away, in the prologue, they are conspiring with Savanna, a wise one of the Shaido Aiel, against Rand. Gowan leads the younglings for Elida. Elida's Aes Sedai do not like Gowan and continually consider options to dispose of him. Gowan blames Rand for rumors of Mergase's death and vows to kill him for it. Gowan and Egwene are in love. Egwene got Gowan to vow to try not to kill Rand, which stays Gowan's hand for now. Gowan is clearly planning to get out of this eventually, as he still vows to kill Rand. Elaine and Nynaeve continue to grow in power and rediscover lost arts, both on their own and by interrogating Moghedian, held by an Adam. Elaine can create Triangrill, and Nynaeve has successfully healed both Stilling and Gentling in Loghain, Swan, and Lyanna. Egwene raised both Elaine and Nynaeve to full Aes Sedai. Elaine is green and Nynaeve is yellow, but the other Aes Sedai don't fully accept them yet. Egwene rediscovered traveling. All these rediscovered talents are being shared with other Aes Sedai, though not all are capable of working them. Though Swan and Lyanna have been healed, their power is not fully restored, and they are now fairly low-ranking among the Aes Sedai. Loghain, however, seems to have been restored to his full power. Matt leads the Band of the Red Hand, who serve at Rand's bidding. They spend much of the book putting pressure on Samael and Ilian, if only to keep his attention. Elaine and Nynaeve learned of a bowl Tarangril, which may allow them to fix the weather. They only know that it's in Ebodar, a very dangerous city. Matt's band is set to put pressure on Saladar so Rand can retrieve Elaine to rule Andor and Kyrian, to rescue Egwene and Nynaeve if necessary, and to put pressure on Saladar in their dealings with Rand. Rand severely underestimated the strength of Saladar, so Matt's band is merely maintaining a consistent distance from Saladar as they march towards Tarvalon. Unknown to the band, Egwene is planning to use the band in her plot against Elida. Matt himself, along with some of his men, are sent with Elaine, Nynaeve, and a couple other Aes Sedai, Tom, and Julian to Ebodar. This plot does not conclude during Lord of Chaos. The band is still tailing the forces of Saladar while named characters are still in Ebodar. The Shaido remain a problem, amassing more forces. The Wise Ones hold that Shaido Wise Ones are still Wise Ones and are welcome among them, though I imagine that this could change after Savannah's alliance with Elidas Aes Sedai and capturing Rand. Mazrum Time accepted Rand's amnesty. Rand charged him with starting a school for men who can channel. Time is very strong in the One Power, perhaps even as strong as Rand himself, and he has many years of experience with it. He's also a quick study, easily mastering tricks like traveling. Rand does not like Time. It's hard to tell how much of this comes from Luz Theron and how much is from Rand himself. Time, for his part, seems a bit frustrated with not being in charge, but has thus far been a faithful servant to Rand. Over the course of Lord of Chaos, Time amasses hundreds of men and trains them well. Their base is called the Black Tower. They wear a black cloak as uniform, and Rand created badges to mark their ranks. Soldier, Dedicated, and Ashaman, meaning Guardian, or Defender of Truth. Rand does not spend much time with his men. They appear fairly loyal, but they certainly know Time better than Rand. Perrin is drawn to Rand, leaving the two rivers with hundreds of soldiers. Fael comes with, which seems standard for Seldian wives. The Athion Mir, the Sea Folk, try to meet with Rand throughout Lord of Chaos, but he never finds time to meet with them. The Shanchan are still scouting and preparing for an invasion. One even runs into Matt, who reminds us that he'll supposedly marry the daughter of the Nine Moons, which is the title for the Shanchan Empress, or her daughter. We don't actually have much info on Shanchan society yet. Fairly early in the book, Alana, who is still mourning the loss of her warder, bonds Rand against his will. She is unable to compel him through the bond, but the act is seen by other Aes Sedai as akin to rape. Marana, in particular, has no real love for Rand, but still has a serious ethical problem with this. Min finally meets Rand. Of course, Rand doesn't pick up that she's legitimately in love with him. He thinks that she's just teasing him, but he still greatly enjoys her company. Rand attempts to play the Aes Sedai factions against one another. Those from Elida arrive in Kyrian, while those from Saladar arrive in Camelin. The Aes Sedai from Saladar suffer an attack from Nihil either overeager Siswaiman or a false flag from the Shido, we don't actually know, and feel that they need to press Rand by sending more Aes Sedai than he allowed permission. Rand is, of course, cautious of being near more than three Aes Sedai at once, and certainly not 13. When a couple of additional Aes Sedai arrive, bringing the total in the city to 13, Rand flees to Kyrian. 
In Kyrian, Rand is tricked by a lie to Aes Sedai when they sneak a large group of Aes Sedai into an audience, masquerading as servants. This move is, frankly, pretty obvious. I can't imagine that anyone reading didn't see this coming the first time they brought in servants to carry gold. They're able to shield Rand and force him into a chest to carry him to the White Tower. They also grabbed Min while they were at it. During the trip to the tower, Rand and Min are tortured repeatedly. Rand, in particular, is beaten regularly. He manages to briefly escape, killing two warders, but not breaking the shield on side end. As Rand has been habitually traveling without telling anyone, nobody notices that he's been taken for several days. Once Barely notices, Perrin leads a large group of Rand supporters, 6,000 Dielsis Wyaman and Maidens, 500 Seldians, 200 Winged Guards, and 94 Wise Ones to rescue him. Loyal and Aram are there as well. Before Perrin's group catches up, they encounter the Saladar Aes Sedai and the Two Rivers men. The groups merge, both hoping to retrieve Rand from Elida's Aes Sedai. At Dumai's Wells, Perrin's group finds that an enormous battle between some 40,000 Shido with hundreds of Wise Ones and the 39 Aes Sedai, their waters, and Gawain's younglings is going on. Rand is still shielded and in the chest. Perrin's group charges in, hoping to save Rand and escape, but expecting death. Perrin calls in hundreds of wolves, eager to save Shadow Killer. As the battle rages, Times Ashaman arrive through gateways, quickly turning the tide. With the Aes Sedai distracted, Rand is able to break free. Our named characters are all present under a dome of air created by the Ashaman. Taim aims to let the battle rage outside while they prepare a gateway out, but Rand orders a counterattack, mostly to save his forces, but Couch is a want to see the Ashaman's power. The Ashaman absolutely destroy the Shido. I'll touch more on this later, but it's absolutely devastating, far beyond anything we've seen the Aes Sedai accomplish. The battle is over in moments. The Saladar Aes Sedai begin to approach Rand, hoping to salvage the negotiations. While in the chest, Rand decided that his experience is a lesson. Never trust the Aes Sedai. He commands them to kneel to him, and they do. On a day of fire and blood, a tattered banner waved above Dumai's wells, bearing the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai. On a day of fire and blood and the one power, as prophecy had suggested, the unstained tower, broken, bent knee to the forgotten sign. The first nine Aes Sedai swore fealty to the Dragon Reborn, and the world was changed forever. In the epilogue, Demondred kneels in the pit of doom again. Shaitan seems pleased with the events of the book. All right, with that out of the way, let's really get into the meat of it. Starting off with the overall point of the book. This one's right in the title. It's about chaos. We could take chaos to mean void, or the state before creation, but I'm pretty sure that we should take it here to mean disordered. Now, let's take a look at this broken into two categories. I think we can look at chaos in this book both as the narrative structure and as the actual events of the book. So starting with the narrative. The Wheel of Time books always follow multiple storylines, splitting characters into groups, but Lord of Chaos is so much harder to follow than what we've seen so far. To a degree, this is simply the progression of a multi-book work. We have more characters and more places to keep track of. Yet, where the Fires of Heaven felt big, Lord of Chaos feels just overwhelming. I took 21,000 words of notes while reading, and I still feel like I probably missed some things. Just keeping track of who was in Kyrian and who was in Camelon was honestly pretty challenging for me. Traveling really changes things here. Rather than getting a gradual journey from place to place so we can kind of catch our bearings along the way, we're repeatedly just dropped directly into a conversation with several characters we haven't heard from in a few chapters. Characters who are only concerned with their city and want quick answers in their situation. I really like how this format forces us, as the readers, to experience a little taste of what Rand is going through. We often hear of how tired he is. Searching backward and forward in my notes in an attempt to keep up with the events, it really wasn't difficult for me to empathize with him there. I think this structure of jumping constantly between complex political landscapes is an intentional structure that Robert Jordan uses to reinforce the theme of chaos. I'm reading these books very closely, as I'm intentionally preparing to write these lengthy posts and then turn them into these videos, and I'm definitely still missing some things. A more casual, leisurely reading would likely miss even more, regardless of how savvy the reader is. I have to imagine that Jordan intended for readers to start feeling a bit overwhelmed by all the nuanced cultures, characters, and political plots. A casual reading of Lord of Chaos would need to fall back on just following the main characters and trends while trusting all that extra stuff to the characters we know. This not only emphasizes the theme of chaos, but also builds up our confidence in our characters. Rand makes a couple of mistakes, but wow, how does he get so many things right? We finally get a little taste of Egwene's leadership abilities as well. Look, I've said a lot of mean things about Egwene in the past, but if she can pull off deposing Elida and becoming the single Amelin seat for the Aes Sedai, despite all of her enemies, the overall chaos of the world, and just Tarman Gaiden approaching, that's pretty damn impressive. Even the cliffhangers felt more discordant than usual. To some degree, cliffhangers are inescapable in books with multiple protagonists, but I was kind of angry when we switched directly from Ram being packed into a box to Matt, Elaine, and Nynaeve looking for a bowl that they don't even find this book. The whole bowl triangle plot almost felt dropped. I honestly wonder whether my copy was just missing some pages. Bear in mind that this isn't just a meaningless side quest either. Although it's easy to ignore thus far, 
Fixing the weather is critically important if Rand's going to have enough food to win Tarman Gaiden. Leaving this thread untied feels kind of strange for a Wheel of Time book, which generally ties up all the major plot points in just the last couple of chapters. Once again, I think this was actually an intentional decision to reinforce the theme of chaos and the frenetic state of the world as we plummet towards Tarman Gaiden. Then we have the actual events of the book. Let's just list a handful of the crazy things that happened in Lord of Chaos. In a single evening, Egwene is publicly flogged for lying to the Wise Ones about being full Aes Sedai, rediscovers stepping into Teleron Riode in the flesh, rediscovers traveling, and is elevated to both full Aes Sedai and the Amaralyn Seat. Nynaeve, who can't even break her block, discovers how to heal being severed of both men and women, something that seems to have not been known even in the Age of Legends. This might be the most significant discovery of the entire age, and Nynaeve first accomplished it without even fully intending to. She's terrified when she realizes that she's healed Loghain without a group of Aes Sedai to shield him from side in. It's hot, even for summer, when it should be winter. This is about as up as down, left as right, topsy-turvy as you can get. Towards the end of the book, Matt suffers a streak of bad luck in dicing that would be uncommon even for someone with only average luck. The Taviran always cause some strange probability, but this is something even beyond that. This is in addition to all the marriages, strange miracles, and bizarre deaths that continue to occur wherever Rand is. We can't see yet how this all benefits Shaitan, but he certainly seems to desire it. Let the Lord of Chaos rule is his command to Demondred. Demondred, who only shows up a little bit in the very beginning and the very end of the book. That leads us naturally into talking about Mazram Taim. So at this point in the series, I think there are two possibilities for Taim. First is that he's not actually a bad guy. Rand really doesn't like Time, but is this fair? Sure, Time doesn't seem particularly happy that some kid is giving him orders, but he really hasn't done more than grumble a bit. He gets a bit snarky when he realizes that Rand doesn't know some basic things, like how to keep from sweating and how to test men for their ability to channel, but so what? He's not half as insubordinate or childish as any of our female characters or Matt. Time occasionally pushes back on Rand's ideas, but this is a good thing. Time is a lot more experienced than Rand, and it would be foolish not to offer some opinions, particularly on issues like evading the Aes Sedai. If Rand had listened to Time a bit more, he probably wouldn't have wound up shielded and shoved in a box. At Dumai's Wells, Time saves the day, despite Rand's orders. Really note that Time's rescue was necessary. Parent's group really did not have a real chance of successfully saving Rand. Yet, despite this, Rand still hates Time. Even without Luz Theron, he did not want to be healed by the man. He thought if time ever touched him with the power, however innocently, he would kill him. Throughout Lord of Chaos, it really seems like Rand is jealous and insecure around time. Note, by the way, that Rand kind of cheated when comparing power with time. Time filled himself with as much sight in as he could, and Rand did likewise. But Rand had an angrel in his hand at the time, and time didn't know that. Having some fear that time would try to usurp him is rational, but Rand really kind of just comes off as petty sometimes. This is a huge departure for Rand's character. Until recently, Rand has been actually pretty modest, almost to a fault. And he still at least tries to be modest with most people, though he's beginning to grow comfortable with his position and with the, the authority that gives him. Being this insecure around another man who can channel feels a little strange for Rand. For Luz Theron, it's actually a little harder to tell. The impression I'm getting is that Luz Theron was actually kind of arrogant even before the madness took him. He certainly has enough lofty titles, and we have to wonder whether he merely tolerated them, as Rand and Perrin do, or if he actively encourages them. His mad voice in Rand's head is certainly arrogant and selfish. And bloodthirsty. Kill him. Kill him now. Kill him. Is Luce Theron's response to Time every time he sees him. Rand has to struggle just to keep Luce Theron from seizing Sidon and striking at Time. But that's not all Luce Theron says when Time is around. And that leads us into the second possibility that Time is probably Demondred. Immediately upon seeing Time for the first time, before Rand even gets a chance to speak, Luz Theron shouts, Samael and Demondred hated me, whatever honors I gave them. The more honors, the worse the hate, until they sold their souls and went over. Demondred especially. I should have killed him. I should have killed them all. Scorched the earth to kill them all. Scorch the earth. Luz Theron didn't really start raving about Demondred until Time showed up, but now he focuses on Demondred even more than he does Samael, which was his previous target. We could take this as Luz Theron simply associated Time with Demondred. Perhaps Luz Theron's relationship with Demondred wasn't all that different between that between Rand and Time. But then, why didn't Bashir recognize Time? Here's a quote. Bashir took advantage of the silence. You say you're Miserum Time. He sounded doubtful, and Rand looked at him in confusion. Was this Time or not? 
Only a man-man would claim that name if it was not his. The prisoner's mouth quirked in what might have been the beginning of a smile, and he rubbed his chin. I shaved, Bashir. His voice held more than a hint of mockery. It is hot this far south, or had you not noticed? Hotter than it should be, even here. Do you want proof of me? Shall I channel for you? His dark eyes flickered to Rand, then back to Bashir, whose face was growing darker by the minute. Perhaps not that. Not now. I remember you. I had you beat at Iranyavar until these visions appeared in the sky. Perhaps this doesn't mean anything. In real life, this wouldn't be odd at all. But this is a book. That the scene is included definitely feels like a clue. Thinking of Lord of Chaos as a novel, we should also consider that Demondred features heavily in both the prologue and the epilogue, but he doesn't really do much throughout the entire rest of the book. Now, this isn't entirely uncommon for Wheel of Time. Nial, for example, also appeared around the edges without making major appearances in some of the previous books. But another clue, which is very subtle but significant nonetheless, is the phrase, quote, as close to a smile as blank had ever seen from him. This shows up multiple times in Lord of Chaos. In the prologue, after Demondred relays the command, let the Lord of Chaos rule, we have the corners of his mouth twitched as close to a smile as Misana had ever seen from him. At Dumai's Wells, after Rand commands the Aes Sedai to kneel, we have time appeared as close to a smile as Rand had ever seen him. Now, this doesn't really prove anything. Plenty of people just don't smile very often. But the wording here is exactly the same. And that seems significant. We should also consider time's power. We don't have a good basis for how strong men are in the one power, other than knowing that they're stronger than women, individual per individual. But time appears to be about as strong as Rand, and maybe even stronger when Rand isn't holding an angriel. Time is also a suspiciously quick study, figuring out traveling without any difficulty at all. Granted, most of our protagonists are similarly gifted, so this isn't unprecedented, but consider that Rand and Time specifically discuss the possibility that one of the Forsaken could try to infiltrate the Ashaman. Time is watching out for any students who learn a bit too quickly, but who's watching over Time? If this is the case, if Time is Demondred in disguise, then we need to consider that there was definitely a Mazarin Time before any of the Forsaken broke free. So, most likely, the real time would then have to be held by Demondred somewhere so that Demondred can question him on ways to make the disguise more convincing. It's also possible that there's some magic going on here, with time somehow possessed or something. At this point, we can really only guess. Now, regardless of whether time is a good guy or a dark friend, or if he's a bad guy and not a dark friend, which I don't really consider to be a real possibility, but maybe. But in any case, what time has accomplished, finding and training the Ashaman, is a significant development. Now, we'll get to Dumai's Wells later on, but this army is extremely powerful. It seems to me that they could probably conquer the Aes Sedai without many losses at all. If they can't now, they will be able to before too long. Their numbers are growing rapidly. Time's boast that he can match the White Tower in less than a year seemed reckless at first, but now it seems almost conservative. Note, too, that Rand has not been doing a good job of ensuring that the Black Tower is bound to him personally. He hardly visits at all and knows only a handful of the men. Are they more loyal to Rand than they are to Time? At Demise Wells, they certainly don't listen to Rand's commands. When Rand shouts for them to stop, they only do so when Time relays the order instead. Now, perhaps this is just good discipline and soldiers, but we've already seen a couple of men that think they could challenge Rand. Then, of course, there's also the risk of madness. We have enough data now to say that the time it takes for a man to succumb to madness varies greatly person to person. It is not safe to assume that the men will be able to hold out as long as Rand. Time and the Ashaman are extremely powerful tools in Rand's arsenal. With them, he may be able to set his current problems in order quickly and then turn his attention to more distant threats, like the Shanshan and finally Shaitan himself. But it seems just as likely to me that Time and the Ashaman will become one of Rand's greatest concerns. If Time is Demondred, or even just working for him, Hawn until he lets the Ashaman know that Shaitan is a cure for the madness. How many of the men would willingly submit to Shaitan to avoid death or gentling, particularly after they've gotten a real taste for the One Power? If Time abandons the disguise and begins training the men without discretion, what lost talents could he impart to them that we haven't even seen yet? This could be really bad. Alright, let's move on to Egwene. So, I've said a lot of mean things about Egwene in the past. She's stupid, childish, and arrogant. Thus far, I've mostly seen her as... Kind of a foil for Leandrin, actually. Egwene is easily the most power-hungry character we have. Her ambition is sometimes worded as though she merely wants knowledge, but the knowledge that she wants is knowledge in the one power. She's not a brown, interested in knowledge for its own sake. She wants greater abilities. She wants traveling and balefire. She wanted to be Amarlin without even taking the oaths long before we knew that that actually was feasible. 
I also do not think it's valid to say that any of Egwene's hunger for power is in response to her time with the Shan Chan. She wanted more power way before that. Way back in Eye of the World, she was already recklessly pushing boundaries on what Moraine told her was safe. Egwene really just likes power and feels entitled to getting it. She's also just a little stupid. I've talked about this before, so I don't want to waste too much time on it here, but seriously, she just keeps doing stupid things. The scene in Lord of Chaos where she tries to board the Atheon Mirror ship is really telling. She tries to board the ship and is kicked off. It wasn't an attack, they just denied her passage when they realized that she was an Aes Sedai trying to sneak aboard. So what does she do in response? She uses air to throw the women on the ship overboard. Not only is this a huge overreaction, but she also giddily awaits the other women's panic upon being thrown into the water. Egwene thought that the sea folk would react the same as she does when thrown into the water. Egwene has some virtuous moments, but I want to clarify something about those as well. Egwene has a sense of honor that the Aiel respect. She willingly accepts punishment to meet her toe, which is a pretty powerful scene. This is virtuous. But to be entirely clear, this is still an example of Egwene's arrogance. She's willing to accept punishment and follow rules when it's her choice to do so. If anyone else tries to enforce any sort of restriction on her, even if it's just some rest to recover from an injury, she's worse than Matt when it comes to obeying. At least when Matt disobeys, he has some understanding that what he's doing is reckless or wrong or even stupid. And he does occasionally actually listen. Egwene simply believes that she's above any rules or restrictions that she doesn't personally agree with, despite her just shocking stupidity at times. That all said, she's kind of nailing it when it comes to being Amarlin. Now, she hasn't been Amarlin for long, so there's still plenty of time for her to make mistakes, but she's really doing a fantastic job so far. Even her flaws are, frankly, not really flaws when it comes to the Aes Sedai. If anything, Nynaeve and Elaine have been a bit too meek in their relation to the Aes Sedai. The Aes Sedai are a bunch of kids at recess, so Egwene's playground bully methodology is actually kind of perfect. I would be more impressed if she was doing this intentionally, rather than just continuing to act as she always does, regardless of circumstance, but still, this is some good growth for Egwene. Maybe we'll see some more good character growth for her in the books to come. Now, since I just said some mean things about Egwene, I want to reiterate some of the stuff I said in the last video again, that, again, Egwene is a very realistic character, perhaps the most realistic of our young characters. A real teenager would, if anything, be far worse. I would definitely have been far worse at her age. Hell. I might be as arrogant as Egwene if I suddenly found similar powers now as a man in my 30s. But when she's set in a context where most of the other characters are far more humble and fearful of their new abilities, she really does stand out as the only one who embraces them without any reservation, even if she knows or at least should know that it's reckless. Moreover, we specifically see that Rand, Perrin, Matt, and Nynaeve all respond with disgust when given respect they feel they don't deserve. Rand, Perrin, and Matt all hate being traded as lords. Rand and Perrin have begrudgingly come to accept it as practical concession, but they feel that it's wrong and they'd stop it if they could. Matt doesn't really accept it at all. Nynaeve, as well, doesn't feel good about being treated as better than other people for being Aes Sedai. She thinks the Aes Sedai aren't as great as they think they are. Egwene, on the other hand, has no problems being treated special. She doesn't necessarily revel in it, at least not always, but she never has that realization that she was born with ridiculous amount of privilege. Yeah, she's worked hard, but most of her peers work hard. That all is until she becomes Amarlin. And here we finally have a scene where Egwene is given something extraordinary, and her first reaction isn't simply, I deserve this, or about time, but instead, this must be a joke, or this must be a dream. This scene is the moment where Egwene starts to improve her key character flaw. Furthermore, she appears to be doing something more than simply improving, but actively sublimating it. She recognizes the absurdity of being handed such a lofty title, but she doesn't back down from it at all. Unlike Rand, Perrin, and Matt, she doesn't have that awkward phase of asking everyone not to call her my lord. She jumps immediately to just filling the position. Rand took multiple books to get to this point, where he can still feel like he's a farmer at heart, but then also perform the correct ceremonial duties as a lord and as, you know, the Dragon Reborn. Perrin and Matt still really aren't there. Matt simply refuses, whereas Perrin needs Fael to constantly cover for him. This is a real strength that Egwene shows here. She's finally learned to question whether she's actually earned the privilege she lucked into, but she's also able to hold onto the pragmatic need to use what tools are available to her, as well as the confidence to boldly take that title and make it her own. 
This is really great for Egwene, and I'm glad I'm finally getting to see the awesome Egwene that people have been telling me I was going to see for quite some time now. All right, so with Egwene seeing some actual character growth, the prize for most insufferable character is finally passed to a new contender, Elaine. I'd say there's a prize, but I'm sure she'd just be angry that it's not big enough and that it's offensive for me to give her a prize rather than allow her to seize it. Then again, if there isn't a prize, I'm sure that'll piss her off too, so Shogunai. At this point, we've seen at least some character growth for both Egwene and Nynaeve. It's been slow all around, but it's definitely there. All three have seen some major accomplishments. Egwene is Amerlin, Nynaeve healed Severing, and Elaine has successfully created Tyangriel. In terms of character growth, Egwene is growing a sense of responsibility and learning to be a leader, while Nynaeve is learning to get a hold on her temper, engaging in some real, critical self-reflection. Elaine is… still just really entitled. She's absolutely certain that she's going to bond Rand as a warder. Frankly, Rand would probably be fine with this. It would certainly make locating her easier. But it's also clear that she simply doesn't care what Rand's stance is here. Elaine also notes that she plans to enforce some stronger control over Rand than she did with Brigida, such as requirement for him to answer her questions. Even for a princess, this seems a bit spoiled. Does she really not realize that Rand has more power than her? Any concessions he makes will be purely out of love, and she's more than happy to abuse this as much as she possibly can. When hearing that Ram plans to put her on both the Sun and Lion Thrones, she's just angry that a man is going to give her the throne. Let's analyze this for a moment. Now granted, the Lion Throne is always held by a queen, so having a man take it and then pass it on to her does go against custom. But I mean, how else is she going to claim it? Merges, for all of her faults, really does understand that Andor isn't going to just wait for her to return. There's always been a line of people just waiting for a power vacuum to fill. Elaine should understand this as well. But she just doesn't. If she wants to claim the throne, then she needs to, you know, actually do that before someone else claims it. The only reason the throne is still hers to take is because Rand has been continually fighting to keep everyone else off it. Hopefully, this just means that Elaine's character growth is coming soon. But at this point, I'm starting to give up hope for her. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Matt and Oliver. So most of Matt's scenes in Lord of Chaos are just marching his band around at Rand's order. Frankly, the fact that Matt continues to follow Rand's orders, despite his grumbling, is actually kind of a good example of Matt's character growth. I can't imagine him ever fully growing out of being kind of a rapscallion, but he's learned to accept that he's a Taviran and Rand needs his help. The Matt who took a dagger from Shatter Logoth was childish, assuming that consequences wouldn't be any worse than, say, a switching. The Matt who was continually trying to flee Rand's pull understood the consequences and was hoping that he, at least, could escape. Now he's in it. He's not happy about it, continually grumbling about being a soldier, but he's showing up. His relationship with Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine is also very interesting. He's definitely offended at how they treat him, which is 100% fair. Yet he's responding pretty well, all considering. Sure, he'll mope a bit to make the occasional scene, but he's not going to abandon them. Quote, I think he made a promise, Egwene said simply, and Nynaeve nodded. Slowly, reluctantly, but she nodded. Elaine looked lost, of course. She did not know him. Elaine, Matt does exactly as he pleases. He always has. No matter how many turnips he had to peel for it, Nynaeve muttered, or how often he was switched. Yes, that is Matt, Egwene sighed. He had been the most irresponsible boy in Emmons Field, maybe in the two rivers. But if he gives his word, he keeps it. And I think he promised Rand to see you back in Camelin, Elaine. You notice he retreated to asking me. In a way, he had. But you, he never changed a hair on. I think he'll try to stay as close to you as your belt pouch, but we won't let him even see you unless he does as we want. She paused. Elaine, if you want to go with him, you can. To Rand, I mean. As soon as we squeeze all the good out of Matt and his band. Granted, in some sense, this isn't so much character growth as a virtue that Matt always had. He's always had a particular sense of honor. The growth I'm seeing here is really that he made the promise in the first place, knowing that then his inherent sense of honor would force him to keep it. Then there's Matt's attitude towards Egwene. Here, he goes beyond the promise he made, trying to support her when he sees that she needs it. Quote, They were all talking among themselves, ignoring the woman they had named Amerlin. Egwene might as well have been alone. She looked alone. Knowing her, she was trying very hard to be what they had named her, and they let her walk alone, with everybody watching. To the pit of doom with them if they think they can treat a Two Rivers woman that way, he thought grimly. Striding to meet Egwene, he swept off his hat and bowed, making the best leg he knew how, and he could flourish with the best when he had to. 
Good morning, mother, and the light shine on you, he said, loud enough to be heard in the village. Kneeling, he seized her right hand and kissed her great serpent ring. A quick glare and a grimace directed at Telmaine's and the others, and hidden by Gwen from those behind her, had them all scrambling to kneel and call out. The light illumine you, mother, or some variation. Even Tom and Julian. Egwene looked startled at first, though she hid it quickly. Then she smiled and said softly, Thank you, Matt. This comes after days of being treated very poorly by Egwene, Elaine, and Nynaeve. Matt has every reason to storm off or even make a big scene, embarrassing Egwene. And perhaps he would have a few books ago. Now he sees that a friend is in trouble and he just naturally steps in to help, even if it's frustrating and forces him to swallow his own ego. The way Elaine keeps undercutting his authority is really frustrating to read, but Matt's response also shows some great growth. I'm actually not sure whether Elaine fully understands what she's doing here. If her goal is to weaken Matt's authority and drive a wedge between him and his band, then she's actually doing a pretty good job. If she plans on doing this sort of thing as queen, then hopefully her generals will inform her of how damaging this is. In either case, Matt does an almost inhumanly good job of managing his temper. Pretty much any other Edmonds fielder would have stubbornly insisted that Elaine's advice is all bad, but Matt begrudgingly admits that she's right, though he's still frustrated that she's often telling him to do things that he was about to do anyways, and often openly in front of his men. When, for example, she makes a comment that getting drunk around Oliver is bad influence, Matt actually listens. Speaking of Oliver, I really hope that he doesn't turn out to be a Forsaken in disguise, or a dark friend. I am continually reminded of Hellmaster Fabrizio from Slayers Next. It's really just very cute seeing Matt's relationship with Oliver. It seems that, so far, Matt really has no idea that Oliver is basically just a younger version of himself. Quote, Shaking his head, Matt started up the stairs. He had to speak to the boy. He could not just grin like that at every woman he saw. And telling a woman she had beautiful eyes, at his age, Matt did not know where Oliver got it. So, not only is Matt a bloody hero, but he's also a bloody good caretaker of lost children. He can grumble all he wants, but Matt just can't help but try to be a good guy at every turn. I am really interested to see how this continues as the story goes on. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Lan. Now, there's not too much to say about Lan yet, but I should note that he's reappeared, having finally reached Nisao and Mirel. It seems that he had a pretty rough trip getting there. Was there really no better way for Moraine to ensure that he wouldn't just go off and die in the blight? I mean, perhaps not, but in any case, it sure seems that he's not doing okay. As he approaches, we get the following scene. Quote, Morel was glad the moon was down already. It hit her grimace. She could handle the healing herself, but Nassau had been studying how to deal with sicknesses of the mind, things the power could not touch. Morel was not sure this counted as a sickness, but she would try whatever tool might work. Nisao could say what she would. Morel knew that she would cut off her own hand rather than pass up his chance to further her studies. She could feel him out there in the night, coming closer. They were well away from the tents, well beyond the soldiers, with only scattered trees around them. She had felt him from the moment this bond passed to her, the crime Nisao fretted over. A warder's bond passed from one eye side to another without his consent. Nisao was right on one point. They would have to keep this secret as long as they could. Morel could feel his wounds, some almost healed, some almost fresh, some badly infected. He would not have gone aside to seek battle. He had to come to her, as surely as a boulder tipped down a mountain had to roll onto the bottom. He would not have moved one foot to stand aside from battle either. She had felt his journey in distance and blood, his blood, across Kyrian and Andor, Murindi and now Altara, through lands infested with rebels and rogues, bandits and dragon sworn, focused on her like an arrow speeding to the target, carving his way through any armored man who stood in his path. Even he could not do that unharmed. She toted up his injuries in her mind and wondered that he was still alive. Fortunately for the two Aes Sedai, Nynaeve is very talented with healing. I wonder if they'll get the reunion in the next book. Okay, Herod fell. Rand's school, not the Black Tower, the one in Kyrian, has been a pretty minor side plot so far. It's mostly just served to kind of humanize Rand, demonstrating that, despite his mission, he still wants to build something good and leave something behind. I loved the science fair scene, particularly Rand's interest in the farming equipment. Rand may never be a farmer again, but it's really heartwarming to see that he still cares about the lives of common people. Herod Fell is kind of a mystery. On the surface, he's just a forgetful scholar, perhaps even a bit senile. But I get the impression that some of his ramblings might be early foreshadowing for some major events. Quote, Snatching his pipe out, Herod drew a circle in the air with a stem. The wheel of time. Ages come and go and come again as the wheel turns. All the catechism. Suddenly, he stabbed a point on that imaginary wheel. Here, the Dark One's prison is whole. Here, they drilled a hole in it and sealed it up again. He moved the bit of the pipe along the arc he had drawn. Here we are, the seal's weakening, but that doesn't matter, of course. 
The pipes then completed the circle. When the wheel turns back to here, back to when they drilled the hole in the first place, the Dark One's prison has to be whole again. Why? Maybe the next time they'll drill through the patch. Maybe that's how they could do it the last time. Drill into what the creator made, I mean. Maybe they drilled a bore through a patch and we just don't know. Herod shook his head. For a moment he stared at his pipe, once more realizing it was unlit, and Rand thought he might have to recall him again. But instead Herod blinked and went on. Someone had to make it sometime. For the first time, that is. Unless you think the creator made the Dark One's prison with a hole and patched up again. His eyebrows waggled at the suggestion. No, it was whole in the beginning. And I think it will be whole again when the Third Age comes once more. Hmm. I wonder if they called it the Third Age. He hastily dipped a pen and scribbled a note in the margins of an open book. Hmm. No matter now. I'm not saying the Dragon Reborn will be the one to make it whole. Not in this age, necessarily, anyway. But it must be so before the Third Age comes again, and enough time passed since it was made whole, an age at least, that no one remembers the Dark One or his prison. No one remembers. Hmm. I wonder. He peered at his notes and scratched his head, then seemed startled to find that he used the hand holding the pen. There was a smudge of ink in his hair. Any age where the seals weaken must remember the Dark One eventually, because they will have to face him and wall him up again. Sticking his pipe back between his teeth, he tried to end another note without dipping the pen. Just in case anyone skimmed this section, note that somebody thinks highly enough of Herod Fell to have him murdered by a golem during the epilogue. Note that this concept of time, which we've talked about before, is clearly based on Hindu mythology. Frankly, I'd rather just direct you to a Wikipedia link than try to explain it myself, as I really only have a passing familiarity. If the ordering of the ages is the same, then Third Age would have to be Dvapara Yuga, which would imply that the next age will be Kali Yuga, which is the Yuga that we're supposed to be in now in real life. My guess is that Robert Jordan only used the broad concept as inspiration, so things wouldn't line up exactly. I mean, the duration alone can't possibly align, as Yuga timescales are just simply massive. We're talking hundreds of thousands of years for each. Whereas ages in the Wheel of Time appear to be much shorter, with the current age only appearing to be a few thousand years old. Alright, we get to see Perrin again. We only saw some brief glimpses of how the two rivers were changing in the last book, so it was really fun to see some more of Perrin and Fael in Lord of Chaos. It might not have much meaning to the overall story, but I really, really liked the stuff with Fael's parents. It definitely reminded me of a couple of similar meanings in my own youth. Of course, I've never dated a Saldean, so it wasn't exactly the same, but the overall vibe was definitely relatable to me. I was kind of hoping that we were done with the Perrin Fael drama, so that was in a way, a little bit of a disappointment. I mean, it's not all bad. Their drama is at least slightly more tolerable than basically any relationship drama involving Rand. But I really wouldn't mind having just a couple of mature, reasonable characters that just, like, don't have any weird adolescent drama. Then again, we are mostly dealing with teenagers, so what are you going to do? It seems that Perrin has a fairly violent temper. We know that Perrin tries to keep a handle on his anger for fear of hurting anyone weaker than him, but until now this has always seemed very boyish. Now we have lines like, quote, Perrin was a gentle man, slow to anger, but just to be safe, Fayola barricaded herself in the bedroom until he cooled down. We also see him crush a wine cup in his hand while talking to Davram. I've been wondering for a while whether we see some more Ufhedner behavior from Perrin, so maybe his temper is part of his transformation. On the other hand, Perrin actually vomits upon seeing the work of the Ashaman, so maybe I'm reading into this too much. Overall, Perrin still seems like a very gentle person at heart. One thing I really liked about Fail is the scene we get of her holding court. This aspect of rule, hearing the problems of the people and serving as judge, is often cut from fantasy novels, but it's a crucial part of the job. It wasn't a critical scene to the story, but I really like these little bits of realistic world building that Jordan works into the books. So we already talked about Nynaeve, but let's focus specifically for a minute on her discovery of the method to heal severing. On its face, this is a miraculous discovery. Unless I missed something, I'm pretty sure that this wasn't even known in the Age of Legends, making this potentially the greatest discovery of this age. The direct impact of this, restoring Swan, Lyanna, and Loghain, is also a big deal. The implications of this, just to everyone inside this story, is also very significant. From now on, being severed isn't final. Even Rand could be gentled without catastrophic consequence. I actually thought this is what we were building to with his capture. Let's also consider some more speculative possibilities for this. That healing severing in men and women is almost the same seems very significant. That it's similar at all wasn't inevitable. How men and women relate to the One Power is fundamentally different. That Nynaeve could entirely restore Loghain, but not Swan and Lyanna, is also interesting. Assuming that Loghain is, in fact, fully restored, which seems most likely given that he's still capable of fighting off multiple women at once, but we don't know for sure. 
I get the impression that this hints at some fundamental traits of the One Power. Quote, Clearing her throat, she wove filaments of Sidar into him. Air and water, fire and earth, spirit, all the elements of healing, but used now to probe. It would have helped to lay her hands on him, but she could not bring herself to do that. Bad enough to touch him with the power. He was healthy as a bull and almost as strong. Nothing wrong with him in the slightest, except for the hole. It was not really a hole, more a feeling that what seemed continuous was not. That what seemed smooth and straight was really skirting around an absence. She knew that sensation well from the early days, back when she thought she might really learn something. It still made her skin crawl. He looked up at her intently. She did not remember moving closer. His face was fixed in a mask of brazen contempt. She might not be Aes Sedai, but she was the next thing to it. How can you do all that at once? Elaine asked. I could not keep track of half of it. Hush, Nynaeve murmured. Hiding the effort required, she took Loghain's head in her hands roughly. Yes, it was better with physical contact. The impression is sharper. She directed the full flow of Sidar into where the hole should have been, and was almost surprised to find an emptiness. Of course, she still did not expect to learn anything. Men were as different from women in the power as they were in flesh, maybe more so. She might as well study a rock to find out about fish. It was hard to keep her thoughts on what she was doing, knowing she was only going through the motions, killing time as it were. That emptiness, so small she could pass right over it, was vast when she slipped the flows inside. Immense enough to swallow them all. Vast emptiness, nothingness. What about what she had found in Swan and Lyanna, the feel of something cut? She was sure it was real, however faint. Men and women might be different, but maybe... There it was. Something cut. Just an impression, but the same as Swan and Lyanna. Something about that cut. If it was bridged with fire and spirit, so... Okay, so maybe this is a stretch, but compare the wording there with Min's vision of Rand. Quote, One of those images she had seen every time she saw him. Countless thousands of sparkling lights, like stars or fireflies, rushed into a great blackness, trying to fill it up, rushed in and were swallowed. There seemed to be more lights than she had ever seen before, but the darkness swallowed them at a greater rate, too. And there was something else, something new, an aura of yellow and brown and purple that made her stomach clench. So maybe this is completely unrelated, but the sense of a great blackness, immense enough to swallow them all, seems very similar between Min's vision of Rand and Nynaeve's interpretation of healing severing. We can only speculate at this point, but maybe Nynaeve's discovery here will actually be important to patching the boar, or even restoring Sidon. Rand's mission is to simply win Tarmin Gaiden, but his wish is to cleanse Sidon. We've also heard that Shaitan's prison was made by the Creator at the moment of creation, and humans cannot interfere. Well, Nynaeve believes that anything but death can be healed. Okay, so if you thought I was going to skip talking about Demise Wells, don't worry, we're finally getting to it. This comes of trusting Aes Sedai. Now, I'm not participating in any public online discussions about the Wheel of Time, as I'm really trying to avoid spoilers, both for myself and to ensure that my speculation and posts here is truly safe to read for anyone reading along with me. Like, if I actually get something right, then I don't want to have to wonder whether I actually saw that on a message board or was tilted the right direction by somebody else. But I have to imagine that this chapter is a fan favorite. I mean, it should be terrible. Everyone but Taim is horrified, but it's the greatest display of power we've seen since Rand destroyed the Trolloc armies at the end of the first book. Even before the Ashaman got involved, the battle was pretty big. Not as big as against the Shido at Kyrian, but still massive. The various forces gathered by Perrin entered the ongoing battles without much hope of getting back out alive. Quote, 800 paces, 700. The Two Rivers men dismounted, taking bows in hand. 600, 5, 4. Debrain took his sword, raised it high. The Lord Dragon, Tabarin, and Victory, he shouted, and the shout came from 500 throats as lances snapped down. Perrin had just time to seize hold of Debrain's stirrup before the Kyrian and were thundering forward. Loyal's lawn legs marched the horses pace for pace. Loping along, letting the horses pull him in lawn leaping strides, Perrin sent his mind out. Come. Ground covered with brown grass, seemingly empty, suddenly gave birth to a thousand wolves, lean brown plains wolves, and some of their darker, heavier forest cousins, running low to hurl themselves into the backs of Shido with snapping jaws, just as the first lawn Two Rivers shafts rained out of the sky beyond them. A second flight already arched high. New lightnings fell with the arrows, new fires bloomed. Veiled Shido, turning to fight wolves, had only moments to realize they were not the only threat before a solid spear of Aiel stabbed in them alongside a hammer of Kyrian and Lancers. Snatching his axe free, Perrin hacked down a Shido in his way and leapt over the man as he fell. They had to reach Rand. Everything rested on that. 
Beside him, Loyal's great axe rose and fell and swung, carving a path. Aram seemed to dance with his sword, laughing as he cut down everyone in his way. There was no time to think of anyone else. Perrin worked his axe methodically. He was hewing wood, not flesh. He tried not to see the blood that spurted, even when Crimson sprayed his face. He had to reach Rand. He was slashing a path through brambles. All he focused on was the man in front of him. He thought of them as men even when Height said it might be a maiden. He was not sure he could swing that red-dripping half-moon blade if he let himself think it was a woman he swung at. He focused, but other things drifted across his vision as he cut his way forward. A silvery lightning strike hurled cat and sword-clad figures into the air, some wearing the scarlet headband, some not. Another bolt threw Drabrain from his horse. The Kreanin labored to his feet, laying about him with his sword. Fire enveloped a knot of Kreanin and Aiel. Men and horses turned to screaming torches, those who could still scream. Those things passed before his eyes, but he did not let himself see them. They were only the men before him, the brambles to be cleared by his axe and loyals and Aram's sword. Then he saw something that pierced his concentration. A rearing horse, a toppling rider being pulled from his saddle as Aiel's spears stabbed him. A rider in a red breastplate. And there was another of the winged guards, and a clump of them, thrusting their lances with Norel's plume waving above his helmet. A moment later he saw Kiruna, a face serenely unconcerned, striding like a queen of battles along a path carved for her by three warders, and the fires that leapt from her own hands. And there was Bera, and farther over, Feldren, and Masuri, and... What are the light were they all doing here? What were any of them doing? They were supposed to be back with the wise ones. From somewhere ahead came a hollow boom, like a thunderclap cutting through the din of screams and shouts. A moment later, a slash of light appeared not twenty paces from him, slicing through several men and a horse like a huge razor as it widened into a gateway. A black-coated man with a sword jumped out of it and went down with Shido's spear through his middle. But a moment later, eight or nine more sprang through as the gateway vanished, forming a circle around the fallen man with their swords. With more than swords. Some of the Shido who rushed at them fell to a blade, but more simply burst into flames. Heads exploded like melons dropped onto stone from a height. Maybe a hundred paces beyond them, Perrin thought he saw another circle of men in black coats, surrounded by fire and death, but he had no time to wonder. Shido were closing around him, too. Setting himself back to back with Loyal and Aram, he slashed and hacked desperately. There was no going forward now. It was all he could do to remain standing where he was. Blood pounded in his ears, and he could hear himself gasping for breath. He could hear Loyal, too, panting like a huge bellows. Perrin knocked aside a stabbing spear with his axe, slashed another Aiel with a spike on the backswing, caught a spear with his hand, unmindful of the bloody gash it made, split a black-veiled face. He did not think they were going to last much longer. Every part of him centered on staying alive for one heartbeat more. Almost every part. One corner of his mind held an image of Fayil, and the sad thought that he would not be able to apologize for not coming back to her. This description of the chaos of battle is just fantastic. This alone would have just been chilling. I think I have goosebumps now just saying it. But it's woven alongside Rand's struggle to break free without losing himself to Luce Theron. Free, Luce Theron's breathed, and it was an echo of Rand's thought. Free, or maybe the other way around. Note, by the way, that it's during this time in captivity that Rand finally has a brief dialogue with Luce Theron. Even before the battle starts, Rand is tortured for days. Don't miss, either, that Rand was able to kill a warder with his bare hands and then another with the first sword, all while shielded. We haven't had much chance to see how this experience might have changed Rand, but we do see how he treats the Aes Sedai in the aftermath, and how he reacts to the carnage brought about by the Ashaman. Quote, No, not for the Two Rivers folk. He could not appear to worry over them any more than over the Wise Ones. Truth to tell, he had to seem to worry less. Amis was out there? The Wise Ones never took part in battle. They walked untouched through battles and blood feuds. They had ripped apart custom, if not law, to come for him. He would as soon let Perrin go back into that maelstrom as abandon them but it could not be for the Wise Ones or the Two Rivers folk. Savannah wants my head, Taim. Apparently, she thought she could take it today. The emotionless quality the Void gave to his voice was appropriate. It did seem to worry Min, though. She was stroking his back as though to calm him. I mean to let her know her mistake. I told you to make weapons, Taim. Show me just how deadly they are. Disperse the Shaido. Break them. As you command. If Taim had been stiff before, he was stoned now. Put my standard up where they can see it, Rand commanded. At least that would tell everyone outside who held the camp. Maybe the Wise Ones and Two Rivers folk would pull back when they saw that. Loyal's ears wriggled uneasily, and Perrin grabbed Rand's arm as time walked away. I saw what they do, Rand. It's... With his bloody face and bloody axe, he still sounded disgusted. What would you have me do? Rand demanded. What else can I do? Perrin's hand fell away, and he sighed. I do not know. I do not have to like it, though. Grady, raise the banner of light, time called, and the power made his voice boom. 
On flows of air, Juror Grady lifted the crimson banner out of a surprised O'Brien's hand and raised it all the way through the hole at the top of the dome. Fire burst around it and lightning flashed as brilliant red lifted amid the smoke billowing up from the burning wagons. Rand recognized a number of the men in black coats, but he knew only a few names aside from jurors. Damar and Fedwin and Eben, Jahar and Torval. Of those, only Torval wore the dragon on his collar. Ashaman, form a line of battle, time boomed. Black-coated men rushed to place themselves between the barrier and everyone else. All of them except Jur and those watching Aes Sedai. Except for Nasune, who peered intently at everything. The tower lot had sunk listlessly to their knees, not even looking at the men who had them shielded. And even Nasune still looked on the point of sicking up. The Saladar group stared coldly at the Ashaman guarding them for the most part, though now and then they turned those icy eyes on Rand. Alana stared only at Rand. His skin was tingling faintly, he realized. For him to feel it at a distance, all nine must be embracing Sidar. He hoped they had enough sense not to channel. The stony men facing them held sight into bursting, and they looked as tense as the warders fingering their swords. Ashaman, raise the barricade two spans. At time's command, the edges of the dome rose all around. Surprised, Shido, who had been pushing at what they could not see, stumbled forward. They recovered instantly, a black-veiled mass surging forward, but they had time only for a single stride before time's next order. Ashaman, kill. The front rank of the Shido exploded. There was no other way to put it. Cadenzor clad shapes burst apart in sprays of blood and flesh. Flows of Sidon reaching through that thick mist, darting from figure to figure in the blink of an eye, and the next row of Shido died, then the next, and the next, as though they were running into an enormous meat grinder. Staring at the slaughter, Rand swallowed. Perrin bent over to empty his stomach, and Rand understood fully. Another rank died. Nandera put a hand over her eyes, and Sulin turned her back. The bloody ruins of human beings began to make a wall. No one could stand up to that. Between one blast of death and the next, the Shido in front were suddenly struggling the other way, forcing themselves back into the mass, fighting to get forward. The milling tangle itself was beginning to explode, and then all of them were falling back. No, running. The rain of fire and lightning against the dome faltered. Ashaman, Time's voice rang out. Rolling ring of earth and fire. Beneath the feet of the Shido nearest the wagons, the ground suddenly erupted in fountains of flame and dirt, hurling men in every direction. While bodies still hung in the air, more gouts of flame roared from the ground, and more in an expanding ring all the way around the wagons, pursuing the Shido for fifty paces, a hundred, two hundred. There was nothing but panic and death out there now. Spears and bucklers were cast aside. The dome above stood clear except for the smoke rising from the burning wagons. Stop! The roar of explosions swallowed Rand's shout as well as it did the man's screams. He wove the flow as time had used. Stop it, time! His voice crashed like thunder over everything. One more ring of eruptions, and Tan called, Ashaman, rest. For a moment, a deafening silence seemed to fill the air. Rand's ears rang. Then he could hear screams and moans. Wounded heaved among the piles of dead. And beyond them, the Shido ran, leaving behind scattered clusters of Suswayaman and maidens with red arm cloths, Korean and manners, some still on their horses. Almost hesitantly, those began to move towards the wagons, some of the Aeol lowering their veils. With power enhancing his eyes, he could make out Rurark, limping, one arm dangling but on his feet. And well beyond him, a large group of women in dark, bulky skirts and pale blouses with an escort of men in Two Rivers coats carrying longbows. They were too far for him to make out faces, but from the way the Two Rivers men at least were staring at the fleeing Shido, they were as stunned as anyone else. A great sense of relief welled up inside Rand, though not enough to still the distant churning in his stomach. Min had her face pressed against his shirt. She was weeping. He smoothed her hair. Ashaman, he had never been more glad of the void draining emotion from his voice. You have done well. I congratulate you. Time. He turned away so we would not have to see the carnage anymore, hardly hearing the cheers of Lord Dragon and Ashaman that thundered from the black-coated men. When he turned, he found Aes Sedai. Marana was all the way at the back, but Alana stood almost face to face with him beside the two Aes Sedai he did not recognize. You have done well, the square-faced one of the pair said. A farmer, with an ageless face and eyes just holding on to serenity, ignoring the Ashman around her. Obviously ignoring them. I am Bera Harkin, and this is Kirunam Nachiman. We came to rescue you, with Alana's aid. That was an obvious addition, at Alana's sudden frown. Though it seems you had small need of us. Still, intentions do count, and... Your place is with them, Rand said, pointing to the ice that I shielded and under guard. Twenty-three, he saw, and Galena not among them. The buzzing of Luce Theron swelled, but he refused to listen. Now was no time for insane rages. Kiduna drew herself up proudly. Whatever she was, she was certainly no farmer. You forget who we are. They may have mistreated you, but we... I forget nothing, I said I, Rand said coldly. I said six could come, but I count nine. I said you would be on an equal footing with the tower emissaries, and for bringing nine, you will be. They are on their knees, I said I. Kneel. 
Coldly serene faces stared back at him. He felt Ashaman readying shields of spirit. Defiance grew on Kiduna's face, on Beras, on others. Two dozen black-coated men made a ring around Rand and the Aes Sedai. Time appeared as close to a smile as Rand had ever seen him. Kneel and swear to the Lord Dragon, he said softly, or you will be knelt. So, I hate just reading out quotes that long, but this section is pretty important. Not just because it was pretty cool, but also because of Rand's reactions. To the people around him, he comes off as very cold, but we can see into his thoughts a bit. He is disgusted by this. He wants to protect his people, but he can't let anyone know that the two rivers can be used to manipulate him. After giving the order, he quickly demands an end to it. There's no madness or cruelty in Rand here. He was only thinking to protect his people, and he's quickly disgusted even by the devastation to his enemies. His order, by the way, isn't obeyed until time relays it. Now, this could just be some good discipline. I mean, these are soldiers. They are supposed to listen to specific sources of authority. But it's definitely something that Rand should be worried about. Who is actually in charge of the Ashaman? Rand or Time? I should also point out that Time not only trained the men how to channel, but also how to be soldiers. They have pre-established commands and the discipline required to carry them out in combat information. The coordination they demonstrate in forming a large dome in tiles and coordinating their attacks in measured waves is really impressive considering that Time hadn't had all that much time with them. The Aes Sedai don't train for battle like this. They seem to work independently, just channeling attacks at will. Time is a fantastic general. Finally, Rand is harsh with the Aes Sedai, but frankly, this kind of seems like the only good move for him to make here. The Aes Sedai's maneuvering is what caused this battle in the first place. Laying the blame on the Shido, Elida, or the Black Aja doesn't cover it. The Aes Sedai are causing more harm than good, even for their own goals. Rand needs to get them in line before Tarman got him. Perhaps this entire experience was a necessary lesson. This comes of trusting Aes Sedai. Never again. Not an inch. Not a hair. All right, that's it for my review of Lord of Chaos, book six of the Wheel of Time. I hope everyone enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe. If you haven't seen my other videos, go check those out. Uh, I'd like to think I'm getting better as I go, so I guess if you start with this one, uh, the first couple are gonna kind of look sort of bad. I, I definitely bought a new camera and then learned how to actually use it just in the last video, so <laughs> hopefully I'm starting to finally figure this out. But as I've been saying all along, I am very new to this. I've only been making videos um, for about a month now. I haven't really done any other video projects in the past, so I'm probably making some mistakes. I know there's some things with the lighting I should really change. Uh, maybe there's some things with my setup. Uh, if you have any comments or any feedback on that, I would really appreciate it. Um, even if it's fairly harsh, critical, or even a little bit mean, uh, I promise my feelings won't be hurt. I really just want to get better at doing this. So, you know, help me. <laughs> um, for the next video, I'm going to take a lot longer than I have for the previous bunch. Um, as I've been saying all along, um, when I started this series, I was actually already done with this book and eagerly wanting to get started on the seventh book. Um, now that I'm finally caught up, I can actually get started on the seventh book and the next video will be fresh right off my mind, not something I'm reading from a script I wrote in advance. So on the one hand, I'm really excited to actually get back to reading and to be able to make a video that's like current to where I'm currently at. On the other hand, this does mean that it's going to be more than just like five days or a week until the next video comes out. Uh, my ballpark estimate is two to three weeks. Uh, it takes me some time. The way I read the book, I take a lot of notes. So it takes me quite a while, about it, like a full week to read one of the books. Then it takes me a few days to write the script. And then it takes me another day to record it and usually another day after that to edit it. So we're, we're looking at two to three weeks, depending on how things go. And if I get distracted, it'll take even longer. But I definitely plan on finishing out the Wheel of Time series. So even if it takes me a little bit of time to get in there, there will be more videos. I'm not just going to end this series partway through. That'd be ridiculous. Uh, no idea what I'm doing after Wheel of Time yet, but definitely finishing Wheel of Time. So uh, please subscribe if you want to get a notification when the next video comes out. And I'm going to do my best to have it soon. Uh, I guess that's all I had. So until next time.